Hello everyone and welcome to Reset Now, the leadership series. I'm Liana Dubois, Director of Powered, Nine's Marketing Solutions Division, and I'm joined, uh, delightfully so, by Paul McIntyre, who's the Executive Editor of MI3. Hello McIntyre, how are you? Great to be here, Liana. I think we're in for a cracking series. We absolutely are, and it's wonderful to have you in the isolation studio with me. Paul and I, on behalf of MI3 and Nine, are really proud to be the strategic partners of the AANA for Reset Now. And we're really thrilled and slightly overexcited to be out of home in the studio and bringing to you what is sure to be a really fascinating and very interesting series over, over the coming months. Uh, Paul, I'm going to set you to work immediately straight off the bat. Do you want to tell us all about our guest this week? Well, Martin Brown, Liana, is, has a very impressive CV. He is a veteran Nestle executive. He started in, in confectionery, and in 2003, he moved to Nestle's headquarters in Switzerland to become the global brand director for KitKat. In 2006, he returned to Australia as the general manager of the beverages division, and in 2012, he became the general manager of confectionery and snacks. Today, he is the director of e-business strategy and marketing for Nestle across the Oceania region, and he is also the chair of the Australian Association of National Advertisers. It's a, Z, it's a CV, Liana, I'd like, but don't have. <laughs> Me neither, Paul, if it makes you feel any better. Good morning, Martin, how are you? Uh, good morning, Liana, and uh, it's delightful to join you. So great to have you. Listen, we might uh, kick off by setting a little bit of context. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say because of the nature of Nestle's business, you have a really broad visibility across a number of consumer products and categories. You know, that includes things like food, pet care, coffee, just to name a few. Uh, and I think it's also probably fair to say through this period, your industry peers and competitors have probably fared a little bit better than some other categories uh, through COVID-19 and through the lockdown. Can you set the scene for us and tell us what your prognosis is so far, specifically for Nestle, but in the broader context of the market, and also what that means for the impact on scenario planning for kind of the next six to 12 months? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. I mean, firstly, I think uh, we should all um, have a huge um, sense of gratitude that, uh, that that we haven't seen a deeper health crisis in this country. Um, but what is clear is that we've got some very challenging economic times ahead of us. Um, I think that just the, the, the point around the panic buying surge is something that um, quite a few um, um, categories experienced a change in, in their demand. And some categories have gone through a temporary period of increased demand that's then settled back down to um, um, pre-crisis levels. And others have experienced a change in demand that reflects the changes in attitudes and behaviours um, that we're all going through in our day-to-day -day lives. So um, definitely we've seen changes in build-up of, uh, of pantry stocking of two-minute noodles. Um, we've seen a really strong surge uh, for Milo, which is a brand that um, certainly offers um, a great taste, nutrition, and a source of comfort for, uh, for, for families at this point in time. But we've also seen some categories where that change um, post uh, the panic buying level has stuck around. And um, we're seeing a category like coffee with um, um, retail sales you know, materially now higher, up to 15%, and that's across all formats. So we're definitely changing our behaviours through this as well. So we're going to see a movement towards, um, you know, much more discerning price and value uh, equations for shoppers, which will mean then, you know, um, a move to, to more budget shopping. Um, we're seeing a movement towards trusted, known quality brands um, through this. Um, we aren't seeing a change in the level of concern around sustainability. So just because people are more discerning around um, the price and value doesn't mean they're not concerned about the environment, about recycling. Um, we are definitely seeing a movement towards an interest, heightened interest around health and obviously a huge swing towards online as well. Martin, beyond the volume surge that you talk about in supermarkets, there's another side to this as well uh, in and around the supply chain, logistics and, and people. Talk us a little bit uh, of, of what's top of mind there for, for, for you and the sector. Um, you know, thanks, Paul. I think that additionally, when you look at the challenge that's happened in the food and grocery supply chain in Australia, we've seen an amazing amount of teamwork and coordination and collaboration in order to restock and keep food and essential grocery items coming to households. 
And I think that reflects incredibly well on the collaboration between uh, manufacturers, um, raw, and raw and packaging material suppliers, um, our retail partners, um, and then all of the key people that have played a role through that, um, through that value chain. Martin, you've got a really interesting part of your title and, and remit, which is e-business. We've seen a surge in e-commerce and online shopping. What's it look like for the FMCG sector and for Nestle? What are the, some interesting surprises there and challenges it's been? Ecom is definitely uh, driven um, by a need to avoid some of the um, challenge, uh, particularly during the early stages of the health crisis of getting into supermarkets. And, you know, this is it's unsurprising that we saw um, uh, the, the surge in need. What was difficult was that the um, supply chain uh, uh, was overloaded during the panic buying crisis. And this in itself um, meant that, that both Woolworths and Coles had to suspend their online deliveries. Um, they're coming back online now, and this is a really important part of the, the, the it's, a, it's a big opportunity for FCNCG brands to, to respond to. We've definitely seen an increased um, surge in sales go through Amazon as well, and we've seen it in some of our direct-to-consumer businesses. Um, what we all need to focus right now on is getting online availability right. Um, uh, where if, you, if you really want to succeed as, as more shoppers are moving online, and, and this is difficult because um, it, many of us have had to make um, quite difficult decisions to prioritise some um, fast moving items over slower moving items in order to maximise our production and distribution output. So, you know, certainly we're going to be asking people to, uh, to, to, to be a little patient with us as we're getting back to our standard level of variety. Uh, and that's going to compromise some online availability. But I think that um, the, the, the rules of the game in, in e-com um, uh, are still going to be absolutely true, that uh, online availability is absolutely essential. Um, getting a good search strategy is, uh, is absolutely essential as well. But I think increasingly as a different shopper profile is coming online, finding the right way to bundle brands together into um, specific occasions and needs is also going to be a real differentiator. Um, and obviously, uh, the greater insight that you can bring to that um, based on the different typologies of households, uh, the, the better you're likely to serve up something um, of, of value and interest in an online environment. Martin, you talked about that early surge in e-commerce. Do you see that settling down now? And is there a permanent uh, retraining of people in terms of uh, more prepared to shop online than what they were before? Or will they go back to the retail store once they're comfortable and things return to some semblance of normal? It's going to be, uh, I, we see definitely an increase in penetration of online um, and that that pattern of behaviour, once people, particularly those that are testing it or, or, or reigniting um, their online behaviour uh, after a break, are actually now working out that with more delivery uh, slots being available and certainly a much greater uh, uh, success rate at getting what you ordered, um, right now, it is incredibly convenient and, uh, you know, that, that convenience is going to stick. It's not for everyone, um, but there are definitely a whole bunch of behaviours that uh, once people have tested an alternative, uh, if it really works for them, they're going to stick with. And, and we see a whole bunch of um, positive behavioural experiments that have come through this that are going to be the kind of things that consumers want to stick with because they're working for them. And I think one of those that's really essential is, um, is is being able to work from home. I don't think we're going to see everyone move back into full-time um, um, office work as in, in the same way that we had before because some of this flexibility is working for us as individuals but also making us more productive. That, that increase that you talk about in, in online, Martin, does it put any pressure or any, any changes on Nestle's how Nestle goes to market, if more people are going online, do you have to shift things around or are you preparing for that, planning for that? Yeah, we, um, we've been setting up uh, um, for a growth in e-commerce for a while because Australia is um, not at the um, leading edge of the curve there whilst it's accelerating, it's behind um, parts of Europe and North America and certainly um, parts of Asia. So we've got, a, we've, we've got a good roadmap of what's ahead of us. Um, so uh, we look forward to it actually.
Martin, we've talked a lot about panic buying. Uh, I'm really interested to understand how the stockpiling that we've seen at supermarket level uh, has impacted purchase volumes and how it will continue to do so over the coming months. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, a, fa a fairly pointed question, but do you think we start to see a little bit of retraction or a bit of crimping in sales at the checkouts? Um, yeah, I think that's one is uh, a lot of people are, are trying to work way, their way through the forecast of that right now. Um, it, it's it's not easy to predict how behaviours are changing at the moment. And, uh, you know, um, like most economists are great at being able to give you a model for what just happened. Um, you know, they're, they're, we're all getting smart about what happened last week, but the, 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 the weeks ahead um, are, are very, very difficult to track down. We do know that the, that the average pantry holdings have increased and um, the, the increase in demand that happened through that, that um, panic buying, um, you know, probably on average netted out that, that your average household pantry is now stocked to two weeks worth of, uh, of, of inventory um, for, for the household needs, which um, is going to buffer and, and probably, and, and we anticipate to be an ongoing buffer um, against any potential um, um, restrictions or, or demand challenges, so uh, or supply challenges rather. Um, otherwise, we're already seeing categories that went through that surge return to their normal um, level. And we're not necessarily seeing at this point yet um, drop downs below that. I mean, some are certainly structurally holding up above. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the, the real challenge uh, that we face ongoing now is the extent of some of the economic hardship that will come from the economy being in such a challenged state for as long as it has been necessarily to keep us safe. And that is going to change purchase behaviours. It's certainly in very discretionary categories, that's absolutely the case, but in non-discretionary food categories and grocery, uh, it'll be the mix of products that change, and that's what we need to adapt to to be uh, to be better suited to to the changing shopper needs. You, you talk two weeks, Martin. I reckon I, my pantry's looking at sort of four weeks, I think, and my freezers at about eight. Um, <laughs> that's the short-term view on what's going to happen, you, you know, with the surge in volumes. Uh, what's your, what are you planning for and thinking about for the next six to twelve months? It's a crystal ball. Who knows? But you will yeah. be planning. What what are they? What does those scenario plans look like? I think that, that ultimately the extent of the economic challenge that we're going to face is dependent on um, the extent with which we have to maintain um, the restrictions on, on movement and um, how that challenges the, the spending patterns that we have. And that sort of varies in scenarios from negative growth over two quarters up to a worst case scenario of 10 quarters. And I think that that means that effective scenario planning now is really looking at what is a best case, um, what's a most likely and what's a worst case scenario, and understanding how you would react and what the different aspects of consumer, shopper, um, um, supply, uh, uh, impact on your partners um, in, in, through your value chain um, will, will work and, and how you would respond in each one of those. And that kind of scenario planning really sets you up well to be more agile, um, um, whatever the situation. I imagine that your your Nestle colleagues and peers internationally will be looking at Australia with some intrigue in terms of how we're tracking versus European and the US. What sort of conversations are you having there and, and what is their view? You know, devastatingly, some regions have just gone through an absolute, uh, uh, you know, a disaster of, of unprecedented scale. and. It's too early to be talking with those teams just yet around um, the variety of lessons that we've had around um, how as, an, a, 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 as a community we've got through it. Um, but we are looking to learn constantly about the role of brands and what brands can do. And I think that, um, you know, it, um, it's interesting. It's obviously a bunch of marketing case studies are going to be written around the, the way in which brands responded to this challenge. I think the urgency that some brands felt to get out and talk in a in a in a comforting um, way um, to remind consumers that they were there for them um, came from a very good place from a lot of those brands. But obviously, the more of it that got out there, the less impact that had. And you know, our focus is right now to be um, relevant, useful, kind, comforting. Um, um, 
but ultimately to be of value. And um, that really comes down to, to providing something useful and valuable for the change of circumstances and the needs that you have right now. Martin, can you talk to us a little bit about how seismic or not the adjustments have been as you lead your marketing team through COVID-19 and the crisis uh, and how you've shifted or adapted or changed the way in which you're communicating or marketing through this period? Yeah, the plan that I had in January doesn't feel in, and isn't relevant at all to the situation I'm facing. And um, to the extent with which your teams are capable of adapting their plans as they go, it's going to be a, a critical success factor. But it's not just the plans, it's, it's actually um, how do you actually understand the impact on your consumers. And more than ever before, I think it's absolutely critical that you've got a consumer insights team that can help you in um, a weekly cycle get an understanding about um, how this crisis is playing out on... Um, households and individuals in terms of um, emotionally, how is it affecting how they feel, what's their, what, what are their drivers of anxiety, what are their confidence levels, how is it changing their behaviours um, and particularly then in those behaviours, what are the needs that they have um, that we can respond to. We've obviously then had a really big challenge in the way in which we can um, um, be relevant and topical with quite fast turnaround consumer communications. Um, so we've had to deploy completely different production techniques as others have, and um, we've had to be engaging ourselves more in the conversation um, as opposed to um, broadcasting with long pre-prepared messages. I think all of that's actually going to make for better marketing communications. It's going to deliver um, increased levels um, of relevance. Um, uh, the challenge is uh, how do we deliver that with a level of, of, of distinctiveness as we're doing it on the fly. And um, we're, we're doing a lot of testing and learning and uh, we're getting better at it. But, um, you know, some brands have got a natural role to play at a time like this. So a brand like Magi, which is uh, an essential brand for helping uh, families deliver um, great tasting, nutritious meals conveniently, um, is, a, is helping um, families that are now doing much more home cooking than ever before and helping them inspire them with new cooking ideas. And to make that a little bit more accessible, that's all being done with user-generated content from um, home cooks that love the brand, uh, have got their own special solutions and are sharing those out in, 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 uh, in, in at-home cooking classes. Um, for those of you who have got young kids, we, 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 they're, they're crawling up the walls uh, in lockdown and keeping them engaged is hard. So uh, over the weekend, uh, Milo um, brought out a new series that we're going to be running that Andrew Datto is hosting for us with, um, with, with some of our sports stars, hosting um, exercise programs to engage kids in uh, um, developing new skills and having fun uh, um, following some exercise uh, um, patterns. And we, we just did that on, on the weekend with Caitlin Bassett, who's the captain of the Diamonds. And we'll, we'll be running a series of that, which we think is quite um, valuable. Um, through this crisis, we've seen um, pet ownership increase. And so for a brand like Purina, um, offering solutions of how, as you're spending more time at home with your pets, what are some new uh, tricks that you can learn? How do you deal with your, um, your pet going through anxiety at this period of time? And how do you prepare them for as you go back to work and they've had this um, uninterrupted um, period of, of your attention? How, how do you adapt them to what's going to be a change going forward? They're just the examples of brands that can play a useful and relevant role. Absolutely. And can I just pick up on a comment that you made earlier, Martin, about the different approaches from some brands and some marketers through this uh, through this crisis? Some have chosen to go completely dark and others obviously have chosen to continue to invest in their marketing as a way of growing their business and protecting margins. Uh, I guess, where do you stand on the debate? If you look back at the lessons of the, um, of the global financial crisis, those brands that were able to continue to invest during that period not only did better during the crisis period, but did better and outperformed the market in growth over the next decade. So you know, I think the, the, the rules remain the same about getting value out of um, your marketing investment. You, know, you really need to find a way to be relevant but also distinctive. Um, uh, you do that well. and. Um, right now, you can um, 
engage with consumers that might otherwise not have discovered your brand or for those that are rediscovering your brand for the first time in a long time, you can start reinforcing that relationship and build something really um, um, incredibly valuable over time. So um, if you can afford it, uh, now is a really good time to be investing in, in advertising and building brands. So, so Nestle is continuing to, continuing to invest in Martin? Yeah, we are. Um, Obviously, the, the, there's been um, some fundamental changes in, in, in our media um, plans, but and the content strategy has changed. But it's absolutely our determination to continue to invest. Um, and you know, this is um, brands play a, a really important part uh, in, in people's um, lives right now. And you know, there's a lot of people watching screens, and they're looking for. Um, um, brands to still play um, a role in, in the content that they engage with. Um, you know, you take something fully away from someone and they miss it. People uh, enjoy great advertising. Uh, it's beholden on us to be relevant, useful and engaging. And if doing so right now, um, we can get a better ROI than ever before. Martin, there's a, there's a theory that I'm interested in exploring with you, which is called ESOF, which essentially is the theory that uh, a brand can grow their market share by ensuring that their share of voice compared to their competitors uh, is greater than their current market share. What, what are your thoughts on that? Is that a valid theory? If you invest above your market share level um, with a, 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 a message which is um, um, not only um, really relevant uh, and 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 uh, uh, but more important, I think, in the context of just how difficult it is to cut through right now, um, distinctive, then that investment is going to be uh, um, driving your market share number up uh, um, if if you invest at a, at, a, at an invest to grow level. Um, and I think a good example of that is a brand like KitKat, which uh, you know we made a significant change in our investment strategy on and, and lifted our investment levels concurrent with doing much more distinctive communication. And you know the content cut through and the branding on that um, seriously increased and that brand has gone through an extended period of market share growth off the back of that. Um, it doesn't go without saying then that, it, that, that, that um, increasing your investment rate with non-distinctive advertising um, is, is not going to be a great investment for you. So uh, it really comes down to the level of attribution to what people see um, to your brand and whether or not people uh, notice it in the first place. There's a whole generation, Martin, not of marketers who have not been through a cycle or recession, a downturn like, like the magnitude we've seen in this. Is there a, a new, do you, do you think there's a new uh, sense that different skills and capabilities are required through and post uh, COVID? Yeah, Paul, I definitely think that's the case. And um, I think that uh, working through a crisis um, builds your skills. And um, I think we will have better marketers um, uh, and, and, and better run brands for it. The things that I think are really important um, during a time like this is um, not only to, to recognise that you have to change your plan and that you need to be more agile in developing something that's more relevant to where you are, you have to get closer to your consumer. And, you know, this is not um, working at, at arm's length. This is, is really getting into direct, to con direct connections to really uh, empathise with what people are going through and understanding how you can make their lives better. Um, and the role that your brand can do doing that. Because at the end of the day, uh, um, a lot of brands are going to be in a situation where particularly where you've got um, um, price value challenge shoppers, um, they're going to be weighing up whether or not to stick with your brand or go to private label. And the quality of your marketing uh, and your ability to adapt to their needs in everything from the way in which you communicate them to them to, to, to the way in which your product bundle comes together and your price and promotion strategy work um, these are all critical levers to get right and you need to adapt super quickly. So firstly, you've got to know your target and so you know who you, you, you're speaking to and, and, and then wanting to relate to them more on the, on, the, on, the, on the basic human needs about how are they navigating their way through the day to day and how does it impact the different members of their household and how are they, how are they feeling and, 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 and adjusting to this. 
That's done with, um, with a lot of face-to-face -face calls. We're all getting a lot better at um, using video conference techniques and um, we've been using um, um, uh, online um, insights uh, approaches for a while. And I think you can still get um, you know, that level of, of connection as people are talking through. People want to share with you what they're feeling right now and what their needs are. Uh, and you know, it's about asking the right questions to the right people and listening at the end of the day. Martin, we are sadly almost out of time, which is such a great shame because we could chat all day. Uh, have you got any final thoughts that you'd like to share with your fellow marketers and, and the teams that support them in their ambitions for growth? Probably the key message I'd say right now is uh, that people are going to remember long after the crisis is finished as to um, how you acted. And, and, and that's true of companies and it's true of brands and it's true of leaders. Um, marketers have a great opportunity to be very influential leaders in their organisation and, and, and drive a greater sense of um, optimism and positivity as well as um, true consumer connection. Um, I think that uh, brands can really be distinctive right now by being um, useful but also being kind. Thanks so much, Martin. Paul, Martin, thanks so much for your time this morning. Uh, to you specifically, Martin, thank you for being so gracious with your time and your insights and being really transparent in terms of some of the things that you've shared with us today. No doubt our viewing audience will find this video series very, very, very interesting. Uh, quite a fascinating watch. And of course, if you are watching us at home from isolation, we hope that you enjoyed Reset Now, the leadership series, and we look forward to being with you again next week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.